This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm excited to introduce you to Carol Ford. Carol has worked in the publishing industry since 1997 and is the primary author of Bob Crane, The Definitive Biography. A portion of the profits from Bob Crane's biography is donated to various charities in Bob's memory, while the balance of author proceeds go towards furthering efforts on Bob Crane's behalf. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Carol. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Carol, I'm excited to have you here, and I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody as we begin, which is, where does your story as an author begin? It goes way back, way, way back. When I was a kid, um, I used to draw my own. I'm an artist, too. So I used to draw my own storybooks. And the very, very first thing I ever did was when I was in first grade and I drew this little Snoopy storybook of Snoopy saving the day. And, you know, the rest of the Peanuts gang were all in trouble and he had to go save them. And that was back when I was six. Uh, but then um, as I went through school, I did writing. You know, I, I loved writing, loved English, went to college, uh, majored in English liberal arts and eventually found myself working for a healthcare publishing firm, which I started working there in um, 1998. Uh, my first, uh, I had worked for another publishing firm for about a year prior to that, and the company I've been with now, I've been there since 98. Uh, I am senior director of editorial services for that healthcare publishing firm. We uh, publish nursing textbooks and peer-reviewed clinical journals. And so I am, I am really entrenched into the whole publishing industry. I also have written other stories, other books. I've written for different trade publications as an as a uh, in the publishing industry. And when it came to Bob Crane, I was always kind of digging in to try to figure out what his true story was. And that went back also to when I was just a kid, about 14, 15 years old. We didn't have the internet back in 1985. And so <laughs> a lot of that was done the old school way with going to the library and looking up the old microfilm, uh, microfiche, uh, sitting there at the library, just spending days and hours on end doing that kind of early research and that's, you know, all of that fit in together with who I am as both uh, a writer, a published author, and working in the publishing industry to this day. Going just, I want to go back to first grade for a minute because I'm, I'm fascinated. <laughs> a lot of authors tell me that they they had a sense, you know, way back when in grammar school mm -hmm. that they wanted to be a writer. And oftentimes they would say, hey, I had this teacher who really you know, encourage me to pursue this and, and to you know, kind of water it and let it grow or a librarian. Did you have anybody in your life who was particularly encouraging, encouraging I, to you? I did. I did. Uh, all throughout my school, I was very fortunate to have teachers, whether they were in my elementary school, junior high school, high school, all throughout school, I was very fortunate. And then when I got into college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I decided uh, English liberal arts was going to be the most natural fit, the most natural thing for me. And I had one of my professors, Dr. Edward Wolf, who uh, taught at what is now Rowan University. It was Glassboro State College. I'm showing my age when I was going to school at that time. And he was the one that really nurtured my, my writing. He pushed me to do better. He, I had four courses with him. He was also my advisor. And he just opened that door for me to push myself harder. He was a tough professor and he did not give A's very easily. And I'm proud that I did get an A for my last course with him, one of my seminars, seminar two, but it was, it, they were hard earned because he was not just going to sit there and pencil with grades left and right just to push people through the class. He was, he was going to force you to work very, very hard. 
And from that, I learned so much. The other person from my college that I, that taught me a lot was my uh, the one course that I took for grammar. Uh, she became dean of the College of uh, Sciences and Humanities many years later, but she, it was her first course that she was teaching at the time at Glassboro State, and she was a tough grammar instructor. And I use everything that I learned in her, her course to this day, to this day, when I'm editing, when I'm doing any kind of writing, that grammar course is kind of like that thing that you know, really is the bedrock of allowing me to get it right and you know really home in there. The Oxford comma, I'm a real fan of the Oxford comma. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there, I was very fortunate. I did have several, but those two stand out. Dr. Wolf and Dr. Vito was, the, uh, was my other professor. Yeah, I think an encouragement is so important for Absolutely. for any kind of creator, but for writers, um, just having someone who believes in you yes. from a earlier age is so important. I'm curious, where where did your fascination with Bob Crane come into play? I loved Hogan's Heroes. And so I discovered Hogan's Heroes like a lot of people my age do when it was on in reruns during the 1980s. It was summer vacation and I was home from school. And I had a tiny little black and white TV in my bedroom and I'm watching Gilligan's Island and I'm watching Bewitched and I'm watching in McHale's Navy. And in the mix was Hogan's Heroes. And I was kind of drawn to that. It's, it's, a, it's a show that has all the elements. It has danger. It has comedy. You know, they're funny, but there's always this, you know, little thing going on on the side where they could get bumped off they could get killed it's there's danger lurking behind the, those corners you know i was always a fan of mash as well but hogan's heroes had that certain special something that drew me in and because of that when i was much younger i wanted to find out what happened to the cast and primarily bob crane now, at the time, I had no idea he had been murdered. I had no idea what the scandal was, because at that point, again, we didn't have any of those easy resources that we do today. There was no quick Google search. So I went to a bookstore and I found a, a book on the great TV kit sitcom book. And I looked up Hogan's Heroes and there was this little paragraph that said, Bob Crane was bludgeoned, I had to go look that word up, bludgeoned to death as he slept and the crime has never been solved. And that just stuck in me as, wow, what happened here? And so that just kind of started this whole ball rolling for me personally to want to learn his true story. And then as time went on and we get the internet, we get all of these resources, that's when I connected up with Linda Groundwater and Dee Young, and the three of us joined forces together to produce research, produce the book that you see um, today. Yeah. D did you watch by any chance on Paramount, um, you know, Paramount Streaming Network, mm -hmm. the, that um, story on the making of The Godfather, the author? Yes. Yes. One of my favorite scenes in that entire thing was when <laughs> Al Ruddy was pitching Hogan's Heroes to, you know, to the network. Uh, did that did that stand out to you as well? Yes. And so I've watched the offer as well. We were very fortunate to be able to interview Al Ruddy. And he actually told us that story and reenacted that story to Linda and me on the phone. Um, as part of the interview that that we had with him. And so it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of recording that we have of him doing that exact scene uh, that you would see in the offer. Um, just brilliant, brilliant to be able to to have that uh, that moment with him. He was a fantastic person to talk with. He he didn't know Bob very well. But what he spoke to about Bob Crane was the casting of Bob and that he was perfect in the role of Colonel Hogan. He was exactly what they were looking for in the role of Colonel Hogan. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, it, just a fantastic show and we're, we're not too far apart in age. I remember, you know, coming up from school and watching all of those shows you mentioned, you know, yeah. Gilligan's Island, Hogan's Heroes. Um, you know, Brady Bunch was probably in the mix there as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they were kind of our, our babysitters after, after, after You're after exactly school, right. You're exactly right, right. yes. 
Um, and you know, it's such an interesting premise for a show because here you are in this, you know, in, in, in this prisoner of war camp, you know, not quite a, a concentration camp. And, you know, you've got, we're not that far removed from, from world war II by the time the show is in production yet. They're able to make you know, what what is pretty much a comedy out of it. And I, I'm not so sure that the show could probably be made today, but, um, you know, certainly back then it was, um, obviously, stood out in, in my head anyway as a as a you know a, a good show a funny show and sure. i never gave too much thought as, as to what happened to bob crane either and i did hear that he was murdered you know while doing dinner theater or kind mm -hmm. of it, something like that um what tell me what 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 would surprise listeners of uncorking a story about the life of bob crane bob crane was complex he was he was he was a human being but he was also very complex. What would surprise listeners is that he is, there is so much more to him than what they have been told by the media, by mainstream media, and by the film Autofocus. So in the media, what happens is, is that there's all this, what we would generally refer to as low hanging fruit. It's the murder, it's the sex scandal. It's, it's all of these things that are gonna generate profit and intrigue and shock and awe and let's talk about the murder and let's talk about the crime scene and it's unsolved i mean bob crane being murdered and then having the sex part of it be uncovered during the course of the investigation and he's a celebrity i mean all of the boxes are checked for you know all of this heavy media coverage and so there's a there's all this glare now, when we started interviewing people, we had no idea what we were going to find out. We didn't know if people were going to come back and say he was the biggest jerk that ever lived. We couldn't stand him. You know, we were just after the truth and the truth told by people who knew him and knew him well. And in some cases, knew him better than most. And in the beginning, it was really hard to get people to talk to us, to open up to us because of all of this negativity out there that was swirling in the media and the film that had been produced. So in the beginning, we had to work very hard at earning trust. Trust came slowly, but when it came, it came really strong and people would understand that we were not out to destroy Bob's legacy. We were not out to just rehash the murder or to make fun and ridicule. We were out to try and understand him. Now, what we learned was that Bob Crane was, for, for all of that out there about his sex, it was just with adult consensual women who agreed to participate in his amateur pornography when he asked, and that was it. It was not, there was no coercion. There was no, you know, there was, there was no kid stuff. There was no, it's not Bill Cosby we're talking about. We're talking about someone who wanted the woman to enjoy it as much as he did. Now, what ended up happening was it got out of control in as far as it became an addiction. He wanted more and more and more of it. So when he would go on the road, he would find women who would be interested in hooking up with him. And at that point, it would be a one night stand. Towards the end of his life, he realized that it was an addiction. He himself called it an addiction and he was looking to get out of it. He was looking to better his life. And so when he was per performing at the Windmill Dinner Theater in Scottsdale, Arizona, there was a man there who was pretty much like the, the theater manager. His name was Ed Beck. Now, Ed Beck, unbeknownst to almost everybody, was a minister and he was positioned at the theater as part of the clergy, as part of his church, the United Church of Christ. And it wasn't just with Bob Crane, it was for any of the traveling actors who would go to the Windmill Dinner Theater chain. And they had they had uh, theaters in Dallas, it was Scottsdale. They, it wasn't just this one theater, it was a chain of theaters. And so Reverend Beck being in Arizona, he was in Scottsdale for 
that particular run of the show. Now, it could have been Bob Denver who was there and looking for somebody to talk to, but it was Bob Crane. And so Bob asked uh, somebody who had been affiliated with the theater who he could talk to about something personal. And he said, talk to Ed Beck. And Bob said, why would I want to talk to Ed Beck? He's the guy that opens the theater at night and he signed, he gives me my paycheck. But then he said, no, he's, he's a minister and he's also a counselor and he can help you. And so Reverend Beck then met with Bob several times in the weeks leading up to his murder. And he, Bob was confessing all of, I don't want to say confessing from the religious standpoint, because it wasn't a, a case of Bob going, I mean, Bob was raised Catholic, but it wasn't a religion piece for Bob. It was a confession of this is where I, I am now. My marriages, my first marriage ended because of it. My second marriage is in trouble because of it. I've lost work because of it. But mostly his younger children were starting to ask him questions that he could not answer honestly and still call himself a good father. And so he was shook. He wanted to make change. And so Reverend Beck, he was a counselor in as far as alcohol addiction, but not specific to sexual addiction. And so he was getting him on the path so that when he returned home to Los Angeles after the run of Beginner's Luck, he was going to go to one of the psychologists, one of the counselors that Reverend Beck was getting him set up with to start this long process. And it was going to be a long process. It wasn't going to happen overnight. There would probably be setbacks, as Reverend Beck told us. There, you know, if Bob could have chosen any addiction, this was the hardest addiction to choose, to, not that you choose, but this was one of the most difficult addictions because if you're an alcoholic, you just don't go to the bar, you don't buy the alcohol. If you're a drug addict and you're looking to get clean, you don't go to your dealer. But when you're a sexual addict, there are people everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's women, men, whatever. Uh, Bob himself was straight, but it you are constantly met with that right in front of you. You walk out your door, there's beautiful men, there's beautiful women. And how do you abstain? How do you get to that point where you can say no and push it away as you would a glass of beer or uh, you know, the yeah. drugs? So it, it was that piece of it. We, we talked to Reverend Beck very early on in the process and knowing that Bob had made this very determined decision to better his life, then that kind of fueled us because it meant that there was some a lot of good in him to get to that point. We didn't really know yet because we, we hadn't talked to all of the hundreds of people that we ended up talking to at that point. We had talked to Bob's cousin, Jim Senich. We had talked to a few people from WICC in uh, Bridgeport. But really, this was the turning point for us that said, OK, he is actually somebody we want to find out more about. We, we know he's got good in him. We want to learn more. And that was the big surprising thing, I think, for Linda and Dee and me, that this was a man who was struggling. What he had been doing was not illegal in the sense of the law maybe his wife's his wives weren't happy with him i know i wouldn't have been but that's between them that was personal and whatever arrangements they had were between he and his first wife he and his second wife and it wasn't forced it was it was consensual and so that's when we moved forward and said okay we're going forward with this and it strikes me what a difference a few decades can make because Absolutely. now you have people becoming celebrities by doing the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, we know who Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton are. I mean, maybe we would have known them otherwise, but they really, you know, Pam Anderson, they, they all have one thing in common, which is, you know, they film themselves or they had somebody film them, um, you know, engaging in very intimate acts, mm -hmm. uh, unforced, un uncoerced, you yeah. know, all consensual, yet their outcomes were, were much different and their um, reputations don't seem to be as as tarnished. Yet here you have, you know, Bob Crane, who, as you mentioned, 
you know, it's, it's a different time, you know, it's and, a different, yes, it is know? a different time. And it's, you know, it's unfair because Bob is held to this standard that is way outside. It's not even in left field. It's outside of the ballpark. You mentioned Bob Crane on social media and the onslaught of it, the name calling, the judgment, the ridicule. It, it's unbelievable. People don't want to hear, you know, and Linda and I, kind of, we kind of troll and we do monitor. We have our own Facebook pages for Bob and, and so forth that are connected to the book and to our cause for his Radio Hall of Fame campaign. And so we can control that really well and so forth. But, you know, something shows up on a, a random classic TV Facebook group where they have, you know, 100,000 members and people are coming at it from every direction. They don't want to hear what we have to say because it changes their fun. It's, it's no longer fun for them to hear that Bob Crane was really a good guy and that he was seeking help and that, no, it, he was not doing kitty porn and no, he wasn't forcing women and no, we're not talking about drugs and, you know, anything like that. It's it's really tough and it's very, very frustrating to to come up against that and say who we are and give us give give them our credentials and say, you know, what we have to say, they don't want to hear it from us because it changes their perception. And the best part is, is they'll say, well, didn't you see autofocus? And, you know, kind of a face palm moment because it that film, if I can just talk about that for just a second, it never should have been made. People who knew Bob watched that film behind parted fingers. Yeah. Arlene Martel, who played Tiger on Hogan's Heroes, who was one of the first cast members to really talk with us and open up to us. She said it it was just salacious of itself. There was no real plot other than let's just destroy Bob Crane's legacy. Let's just make him out to be the most pathetic character at to the point where at the end of the film, he's thanking his murderer because, you know, he's got no life and, you know, he thank, thank you for killing me as I'm, you know, so, so beyond repair. Um, interestingly, autofocus, the autofocus uh, director, Paul Schrader, has come out to publicly say that the film autofocus was not even meant to be true or factual it was not supposed to be. He said, you know, I wasn't going for that. It was never to be true or definitive. Who cares? I wanted to get at something meaty. You know, what did you want to do? Watch Alan Hale Jr.? You know, it, it, that's boring and dumb and stupid. I wanted to invent this character. John Carpenter, the the um, not the director, but the man, the main suspect who uh, they had, or, um, you know, it was always the police's main suspect in the murder. He was tried and acquitted. But he's like, he's not even as important in Bob's life as I've made him out to be in the film. And so you've got this film that's sitting out there that is exaggerated at best and wrong at worst. And that's what people primarily are basing their judgment of Bob Crane on. And it's it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, and it's tough too. I mean, it's it's got an all star cast, you know. Yeah. Oh, Frank yeah. Kinnear, William Defoe, oh, Rita, yeah. you know, Mrs. Tom Hanks, you know, is his <laughs> yeah. is in it. Well, I, what's funny is I I know um, in in my job one of the editorial board members that I work with is she lives out in Arizona, and she <laughs> she is friends with Greg Kinnear's parents. They are neighbors. They're not, I mean, Arizona's, you know, neighbor, your neighbor is three miles away, but they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're neighbors out in, out in Arizona. And I always joke with her and I say, so how are Mr. and Mrs. Kinnear? And when does Greg want to have a sit down with me so that I can go over autofocus with him? <laughs> because it's a shame that he did the movie because otherwise I do like his work. And I think he's a, he's a, a good guy. I don't think he's a bad guy. Uh, but unfortunately the role, uh, it was damaging to his career in the fact that there were people who knew that this was not Bob Crane, who in the industry kind of backed off from him for a while. Now I see he's been coming back into the circuit um, with other films and I, I like Greg Kinnear. I don't dislike him, but I just wish he hadn't taken that part uh, because the film never should have been made. It was yeah. a disaster. Um, well, you know, besides, uh, I mean, most of us know Bob Crane from Hogan's Heroes, but uh, he, he got a start in radio. Is that right? 
Yes, he did. So he actually got his, his start playing drums. And that goes all the way back to Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, that's when... my, you know, my, my, own, my own hometown. <laughs> yes. And so he, Bob was born in 1928 in Waterbury. But very shortly after he was born, they moved the family to Stamford. And when he was in Stamford, around the age of 10 years old or so, he and his parents and his brother, his older brother, Al, they went over to the World's Fair in 1939. And he saw Gene Krupa for the first time. And he was just, just, that was it. Drums. He just wanted to be a drummer. He wanted that. He The spark was lit. He wanted to be a drummer. He goes on to play drums in Stanford Junior High and Stanford High School. And while he's in Stanford High School, he is known as Stanford's drummer boy. His classmates just adored him. They he would he would front their jazz band. There was the the Crane Catino jazz band. Ted Catino was um they kind of went back and forth as to who was going to front the band. Don Sappern was another Stanford um fellow who was in the the jazz band with Bob and you know, talking with Don and talking with some of his other friends, Bob was just the center of of that activity. They would have these uh, assemblies in school, and he was just all about music. But he he missed the big band era because they graduated in 1946. Big band era is dying away by about 45. Not dying away, but it's it's making way for the 1950s, your Frank Sinatra's and things like that. And so in order to be close to the music that he loved so much, that was when he said, okay, I can't be a, I can't be a jazz drummer professionally and earn money. He was where he was working at the time was at Finley Star, Finley Strauss Jewelers, which was on uh, Atlantic. Main and it was it was it, where I'll tell you where it was. It was where Stamford Town Center is, where the on ramp is, where you would go to park. Yeah, that's where Finley Strauss Jewelers was. It was at it was on Main Street. It was at four four fifty five Main Street, and it was right where Stamford Town's parking garage on ramp is. And he worked there as the most miserable watch repairman in the world. He <laughs> hated it. He hated it. The but. But the owner of the store wanted to give the store to Bob. Now, his dad was very excited about this because they they lived through the Depression. They knew what it was like not to have money. They knew what it was like to not have a steady paycheck. And so when the owner of the jewelry store says, I'm going to will my jewelry store to you, and he says, no, I want to go into radio, his dad was like, are you nuts? You know, what are you doing? You don't know. You're going to take the jewelry store. But he wanted radio so badly, he put his, um, they wouldn't call them air checks back then, but he would make the tapes, the recordings, the wire recordings, and he would send them out all up in New England looking for that one station that was going to be his big break. When he and his first wife, Anne, honeymooned in the Poconos in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, there's there's a little, and I know this because I used to live in Stroudsburg, um, there's a little radio station called WVPO, the voice of the Poconos. And he auditioned. He, he wanted, he went in for like a cold call during his honeymoon. He walked across the street from the hotel, walked across the street, went to this, this small um, VPO radio station and says, I'd like to have an interview, an audition. And they said, yeah, no. Nope. And when he got back to the hotel, everybody at the hotel was making fun of him and they were calling him the voice of the Poconos the rest of their honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And so, you know, he, he tried really hard. And that first, that first offer came in from WLEA in Cornell, New York, up past Rochester. And his dad did not want him to do it, but his mother said, you know what, if this is what you want, go for it. I'm behind you. And so he did. And he started driving up to Hornell. The car broke down on the way and he ended up hitching a ride to the station in the back of a wagon, a farmer's wagon. So by the time he gets to the, to the radio station, he has hay and bits of dirt and all kinds of stuff sticking up out of his suit. 
And he goes in and he says, okay, I'm here for the job. And they said, okay, great, here's a broom. And they said, he's like, what do you mean here's a broom? No, 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 I'm here to go on the air. And they're like, oh, no, 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 you're here to mop the floors and sweep. You're the janitor. You're the hired janitor. Oh my goodness. And he says, well, okay. And he says, all right, I'll, I'll do that because at least I can say I'm working in radio. And so he, he said, okay. But within a week, the on-air morning person either got fired or quit. Anyway, there was an opening and they said, all right, let's see how funny you really are behind the mic. And that's how he ended up getting that first job in radio at WLEA up in Hornell. There's something so interesting to me, or maybe it's poetic or anti-poetic about a drummer who does not enjoy fixing timepieces. <laughs> Yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, he, he, he really, but see, you know, Bob, Bob was a lot, you know, we asked people, and it's interesting the responses that we got back, but we would ask people, how much of Colonel Hogan was Bob Crane? So, you know, Bob's playing drums, right, in, in Hogan's Heroes. He played at least twice. Um, he, he did the, the last one close to in the sixth season. He does a whole drum set jam uh, in the, in the uh, last season, in the first season, he's got a whole timpani set in his barracks in his office in the barracks, which, you know, you have to suspend belief a little bit, but Bob hated doing that kind of, just that kind of work. He wanted to be out in front. He wanted to be engaging with, with people and, when he was when he was working at the jewelry store, the jewelry store didn't just sell jewelry and watches; it also sell sold uh, appliances and silverware and and radios and things like that. And there's this one story that he told, and it's it's like right out of a Hogan's Heroes script. So they had like a like a you know you would come in and you would like a layaway kind of thing. You'd come in and put you know another few dollars down, another few dollars down on a television radio, whatever. And the owner of the of this jewelry store said, okay, we're going to try and sell this TV, but it's broken. But we still have to sell the TV. How are we going to sell this broken TV? So <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but this is the story he told. He took the tube, the, like the, you know, the, the tube out of the television. <laughs> and the lady came in and the owner's trying to sell this television. And in the tube was Bob's face. <laughs> like acting like he was on the television and they're like you know she's like okay well I guess it works and and it just I can just picture this this <laughs> this moment of Bob trying to sell this television by putting his head through the, the, <laughs> the, the, the tube and this woman buying it whether or not that happened Bob was a teller of tales Bob told many people that he had he told people he used to tell people that he dropped out of out of high school it got picked up in the press long before he had been had been murdered. And it was reported maybe once or twice here or there in like, yeah, TV Guide or LA Times or whatever. But when, after he had died, Robert Graysmith came out with the very first book about Bob Crane, and it was mostly about the murder and the scandal. It was called The Murder of Bob Crane. It was actually what Autofocus was based on. It came out in the early 90s. And he found that, that rogue article where it said Bob Crane dropped out of high school. And Robert Graysmith writes, Bob Crane dropped out of high school and he would feel insecure about it for the rest of his life. So we found out, and I spent many, many, many days years going back and forth. I'm in Philly. So I would just hop the train. I'd be up in Stanford in two and a half hours, if that. And I would, I would just, I would go and I would just, I would hang out with certain people, Charlie Zito for one, uh, the Zitos, uh, who are great people, wonderful people, Jane Golden, who also is, is beautiful. All of, you know, these are Bob's classmates, but I would go and I would go to the, I would go to the high school. I went to the high school and I said, you know, did Bob Crane graduate? Where are your records? And they pull out the yearbook and they say, well, he sure did. And he's right there in the yearbook. Later on, as we interviewed people and I found more people from his class and so forth, you know, there was no question. He was, he graduated. He's in the program. We have the diploma. We have, we have all of that now. And so it became <laughs> kind of a mission for me to find out where did this rumor start? 
And so I talked to so many people from his graduating class and the one, the one member of his class just started laughing and she says, well, I'll tell you where it started. He said, he did it. It, it came from him. And I said, what, what do you mean it came from him? And he, she said, we never understood why, but he would joke about, yeah, I, I dropped out of high school. And, and it's like, so it was like, are you kidding me? All this time it was him. It was just him telling a tall tale. And so he told a lot of, of a lot of those self-deprecating humor type stories that unfortunately in some cases got picked up as fact, never checked, never looked beyond that one little article here or there. And then they became somebody's version of the truth but not the truth yeah um so where does he go from uh, from that radio station in upstate new york he goes to he comes back to connecticut he goes to bristol he's there for a few months and then he ends up in bridgeport first with wliz and then wliz buys out wicc and the rest really is history bob spent uh four and a half years at wicc he he had such a huge market share in radio at WICC uh, to the point where other CBS stations up like up in Boston, uh, WEEI, he was his his range was so large that WEEI up in Boston, he was killing them in the ratings. And so that's how he ends up in Hollywood because he wanted New York, couldn't get into New York. He's killing all of the stations in, in the, the listening uh, range in um, out of Bridgeport. WEEI, he did not want to go to WEEI. He didn't want to get locked into a three-year contract. But WEEI being a CBS station out in Hollywood, they had uh, Ralph Story was leaving the morning slot to go do the $64,000 question. And so they had an opening and it was kind of like, well, if we can't get him up in Boston, we're going to bring him out to, to Hollywood. Now, Bob's radio show was very different. And so the, what he was able to do at WLEA or WBIS or WICC, which was play his own records and do sound effects and play his drums, all of this would have been some of which would be taboo out at a union station because at a union station only the engineer can play the records the jock just talks on the on the mic you don't touch the records that's the engineer's job so they had to go into a lot of negotiations because bob was not going to bend he said i'm going to do the show my way or not at all but in the end the station prevailed knx prevailed and he got what he wanted and they pulled him out to the west coast they entered him into a five-year contract and the rest is history. Out in LA, he kind of shocked audiences at first. He was the first real shock jock of his day. Um, but he always knew where to draw the line. He knew how to keep it to, you know, the things he was doing in radio were so cutting edge. He was making, not making fun, but he was toying with the commercials. So he was, you know, taking the ads that were coming in and he was splicing his own sound effects in and, and doing voiceovers. And, you know, if you're the paying advertiser and it's not what you send in, it could be a little bit jarring. Uh, but he was getting people to actually listen to the commercial and not turn the dial. So instead of just hearing the flat, you know, commercial for whatever the product or service was, now you've got a skit going and he would revisit it later on in the show. And he had all kinds of things happening in his radio show. And he became not the number one disc jockey or radio personality as he preferred to be called out in LA, but he became the most um, sought after uh, celebrities wanted to be on his show to be interviewed. And so he really earned K and X ton of money a ton of money yeah was he was he earning I mean, a good living himself at that point in time mm -hmm. or, or yeah he was he was uh he was one of the highest paid and then when he when he after the first five years there was a no acting clause in that first five-year contract after the first five years in 1961 he is now able to start acting and that's when he goes and he gets a job with uh, the Donna Reed show. He does well. First, he does Dick Van Dyke, and then he goes on and gets the semi regular part on the Donna Reed show. So he's doing both K and X radio and the Donna Reed show both at the same time. 
He leaves the Donna Reed show because he found he found it to be boring. He didn't like it was just kind of like, I, you know, the father white picket fence, you know, or the husband white picket fence next door neighbor thing. He wanted something a little bit more interesting, but he learned a lot from Donna Reed. And contrary, again, to popular belief, he didn't quit over money. He didn't quit because they didn't like him. He wasn't fired. He just left because he was bored and he ended up then getting offers from all other kinds of uh, shows, including My Mother the Car and Please Don't Eat the Daisies. And then Hogan's Heroes came up and it was interesting. He thought it was, um, yeah, he was a little bit concerned at first because that was, again, you're talking, you know, you're talking only 15 years out from yeah. World War II. His brother had served in the war. His Family members had served, you know, other family cousins had served in the war, uncles had served in the war. And he was very sensitive to how our veterans and former POWs would have reacted to the show. And so he had a trailer made and sent it out to veterans groups to get their feedback before he signed. When they came back and said they loved it, that's when he agreed to do it. Yeah, so he kind of was making sure. I mean, you're, I mean we're you're painting a picture here of a guy who, you know, had a, I don't want to say typical career in Hollywood, but he, he was a driven individual, knew what he wanted to do, was willing to take a risk, you know, goes to the small market radio station to sweep the floor, yeah. gets airtime, builds up his career, winds up in LA, starts acting after five years of, of you know, building up a radio career and, and personality. And he's entering TV and he's he seems to be doing all the right things. Um, this is a story that you don't really, you know, you, the behind the music of of Bob Crane is not, you know, is not being told. Um, certainly, the way that that you know you and your co-authors have laid it out. Yeah, it's and again, that's where it becomes very frustrating because we do know his true story. We've talked to hundreds of people, yeah, you know, from all walks of his life. You know, from people who knew him when he was just a little guy. You know, six years old, going to elementary school, walking to Julia Stark Elementary School yeah. and, you know, singing along, you know, with his classmates, you know, the songs of the 30s and, you know, all through his school days, all the way through radio, all the way through his careers in Hollywood, which is which includes both television, movies and also theater. People think he was just doing beginner's luck at the end of his life and, you know, you just do this thing. He actually produced and directed Beginner's Luck and he had been doing Beginner's Luck. Uh, he started doing it in 1969 and he's one of the very first uh, original cast uh, to the point where the playwrights, Norman Barash and uh, Carol Moore have him in the book. So if you were to buy the, the playbook to do the show yourself, you know, if a theater company wanted to do it, He's in the playbook. His name is in the playbook. He would take that play and he would rewrite it and he would make it stronger and streamline it. And I have you know, copies of, of the playbooks of Beginner's Luck and Cactus Flower where he's going through and just handwriting all these notes throughout the book to tighten it up, change the dialogue, make it funnier, you know, make it you know less cumbersome. So he was doing that all before you know, 1978. He was, and he was in theater back as far as 1959. So it's not that he just, oh, well, I'm all washed up now and I'm going to go do dinner theater. He was, he loved the stage. He was doing the stage, stage work for a long time prior to 1978. Yeah. And, you know, not too different from, from today where you have big actors doing, you know, stage performances because they love, they love the stage. Mm hmm. It's exactly Al, right. Al Pacino, you know, does yeah. a lot of Shakespeare. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Leonard Nimoy was doing. Uh, I remember my mom and one of her friends went to see Leonard Nimoy in Philly. I think it was at the Walnut Street Theater. And and I mean, so, you know, it's not all that different. But for some reason, you know, Bob gets this, you know, bad rap because and, and some of it was, you know, you look at Colonel Hogan and he is this, you know, perfect almost person, you know, I mean, look at him, he's strong, he's courageous, he's got, you know, he, he it's all of this, you know, stand up person. Yes, he's kissing all the fraul lines along the way, uh, but no different than any of the other other act, uh, characters in, in the show or, or other shows. Um, but 
there's such a contrast with what you see on Colonel Hogan compared to what is found at the murder scene, which is the camera setup and you know, the 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 you know the all the pornography and you know it, it becomes this. <gasps> when I was doing, it was the first presentation that I ever did, and I like to tell the story because it shows how people have this very different view of Bob Crane based on what has come out since his death compared to what we have learned about him. And, you know, we're, we're not sugarcoating anything. We talk about his addiction in the book, but we do it in a way that is, you know, very constructive. We don't laugh at him. We don't say, ha ha, you know, whatever. We're looking at it from through the lens of a very, you know, where, where would he be today if he had come out and said, I am a sexual addict and I'm seeking help? You know, we look at it that way. We don't pretend he was perfect. He wasn't perfect. Um, but does he deserve this heavy you know, judgment that is cast on him? No, he doesn't. So this woman who had attended, this was at the Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention back in 2015 when the book first came out. I had uh, Bob's son, Scott, his second son, Scott, uh, had let me borrow his crusher cap from Hogan's Heroes. And I was giving a presentation. And so there was going to be this great big reveal of this cool piece that now is with the Liberty Aviation Museum in Port Clinton, Ohio, uh, that Scott donated. Um, but so I do the presentation. But prior to that, I was in the vendor hall and I'm selling and signing copies of the book. And this this lady comes up and she says, oh, I used to love that show. That was my favorite show. But after I learned about him, I could never watch it again. And I said, why don't you come to my presentation on Saturday? I have a slide presentation and I was going to go through, you know, I, I have a presentation that Linda and I give when we when we do that. Um, and I said, why don't you you come to my to my presentation oh i don't know and yeah well maybe and she kept kind of circling back around around again and again and the presentation day came saturday came and, and i'm up there and yeah i'm doing my thing and afterwards everybody kind of came forward to the podium they all wanted to see the hat and you know some of the other items that i had there and she was there and i said i said oh wow i said you came i said that's that's great you know but she was crying and I'm thinking, oh boy, was I that bad? You know, geez, you know, I make them cry. <laughs> and she says, and I will never forget it. She says, thank you. Thank you for changing my negative perception of Bob Crane and giving me my show back. And it just, you know, it was, it was powerful because there are people out there who refuse to watch Hogan's Heroes because, ew. Bob Crane. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that creep, that part, you know, the whole bit. Um, and it's, that's, it's frustrating. It's really yeah. frustrating. Yeah. And, and, you know, Michael Jackson still gets a lot of airplay over the mm -hmm. airwaves. You know, mm -hmm. Bill Cut, the Cosby show is still on. Yes, and, it is. And, and Tiger Woods, we watch him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he doesn't play golf as often anymore, but everyone, and that's the thing, like with Tiger, he had a comeback story, you know, he, he was up, he was down after his mm -hmm. personal scandal broke. Then he comes back, wins the masters and, mm -hmm. and everyone is, you know, mm -hmm. he's back and we love this redemption yes. story yet. Bob Crane doesn't get the redemption story. And you know, perhaps it's because he was murdered and, and it's unsolved. And maybe that's a more interesting story for people to, to hear, but it's certainly not doing him justice. No, it isn't. And we, you know, I confess, I watch Investigation Discovery too. <laughs> you know, a, a true crime is a huge market today. Look at all the true crime podcasts. Yeah. Look at all the true crime television, sh you know, t television shows, you know, Homicide Hunter and, you know, Fatal Vows. And, you know, you've got, it, it's like, gosh, you know, where did we get so dark? <laughs> um, there, It's everywhere. You've got it from you know, every every time you go and turn on the TV and you're streaming something or look for podcasts, there's true crime and unsolved is is everywhere. And and it it does tap into our morbid curiosity. It does tap into our need to, you know, for closure. If something is unsolved, it bothers us. We don't like it very much. We we don't you know, we don't like things that are left unbaked, you know. 
um, with Bob, Bob is easy. He's, he's easy. He, in other words, he's a subject that they can fill a 45 minute show talking about the two weeks leading up to his murder, doing the 40, you know, the 48 hour thing or however they do the lead up, they reenact stuff. And some of it is not accurate. And then they, they get to the murder and then they you've got the crime scene. The crime scene photos are all over the internet and they are horrible. They're terrible. Um, and it's, it's morbid curiosity and people are drawn to that. I get it. I understand that piece of it. How many of us are watching the, the Murdoch case right now and, and seeing all of that play out, you know, that there, there's this piece of us that, you know, we don't want it to happen to us, but if, you know, it's interesting if it's happening over there and we can watch it from afar through a very protective, you know, television screen, we're not, you know, in it, but we can watch it. Yeah, uh, but you know, listen I, I, to it. I think the flip side though is that there there is a market and a hunger now, oh, yeah. particularly in, in a con in the podcast space for oh, yeah. hearing these stories and mm -hmm. challenging the conventional thinking that's behind them. So, you know, there mm -hmm. was something that came out a, a, a year or so ago about Tracy Lords, um, mm -hmm. you know, who was a underage porn star. Um, and th that sort of challenged what the accepted narrative was of, of her life. I, I mean, there's certainly an opportunity to do something like that with Bob Crane's life using your book as source material. Oh, sure. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of our goals is to have a, a full fledged documentary done and done right. Either, you know, like, gosh, there's so many streaming services, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, you know, pick one. It, it, it could happen. Uh, it's just finding the the time and the resources to do that. I think that right now what's been done it's just been the same broken record it's been the same thing over and over and it gets done at nauseum over and over his first son robert is he kind of spearheads that piece of it and why we we don't know it it maybe it's his way of dealing with it but he is very much in the mix of all of that murder and sex his own book is all about it yeah he's he's very much into that group he is the only one the rest of the family is either they they won't talk about about bob or they will talk only to us yeah. and you know he's very much in his own place out there in the whole i'm going to talk i'm going to try and solve the crime or i'm going to and he has his own theories and theories that have been disproven by law enforcement you know linda and d and i get asked who do you think killed bob crane and yeah you know, there are so many theories we don't talk about that because anything we say is not going to it, it could anything we say about a theory will lead somebody down a potentially wrong path. If we say, oh, we think it's this person or we think it's that person, what we can conclusively say is that the police have decided or that they have forensically proven that it could not have been a woman and they have arrested, tried, and acquitted the main suspect, which was John Henry Carpenter, but he remains to this day their prime suspect. They just didn't have enough evidence, physical evidence, to be able to convict. And so yeah. aside from that, could have been anybody. But we can't, how, how are we to say, oh, it's this person or that person or this person or that person? You can't because there is no evidence to prove or disprove any of the remaining theories that are out there. A hunch right. isn't isn't evidence. You know, I think we we know more about sex addiction now than we did. You know, probably when Bob was murdered. Yeah. Um, and we know that the 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 roots of addiction, whether it's sex, alcohol, drugs, is is usually some kind of trauma that's happened to somebody in, you know, younger in childhood, et cetera. Did you in, in your research for yeah. in, for Bob's life? Did you uncover any any major trauma in Bob's life? major trauma um you know he had a, a strict upbringing he was raised in a catholic irish russian uh family in uh stanford his uh the seniches are the uh russian side uh that was his mom's side and the cranes were mostly um irish 
both were Catholic, very heavy uh, Catholic. Uh, but there was no, you know, that we uncovered, there was no anything traumatic. The only piece, you know, was his father was very strict, but my, my parents were very strict, <laughs> um, you know, defined strict. Um, he couldn't drive the car. So Don Sappern had to drive him around to the different, you know, jazz band gigs that they were doing uh, in and around Connecticut. Um Norwalk, you know, so forth and Stanford and whatnot. But it, yeah, nothing, nothing that jumped out is, oh, he was, you know, traumatized as a kid. The war was traumatic in that his brother almost died. Um, he was on the USS Bunker Hill and uh, it was struck by two kamikaze planes. And they did not know. They knew that the that the ship had been attacked, but they didn't know if Al had survived or not. And so during the, the several weeks where they didn't know, they knew that there was a possibility that he had died. Bob had a really difficult time with that piece of it, but nothing that would have traumatized him to the point of, oh, of, you know, I'm, I'm going to you know, go off and do this thing. It, he always said, I just liked sex. You know, yeah. I just liked it. And, you know, and, you know, it, it was something that started out as put up or shut up because he was very, you know, oh, jovial and, you know, saying things and whatever. And in the beginning, it was, you know, a woman called him out on it and said, all right, you're all talk, no action. Let's see. Let's see what you can do. And so one led to another, led to another. He decided he liked it. You know, now, again, whatever, you know, his first wife knew and, um, you know, whatever arrangement they had, I, you know, I can't imagine she was happy, but they had kids and it was the 50s. So, you know, he, it wasn't like he ran out to Hollywood and just went crazy. This was happening in, in Connecticut. This was happening yeah. in Bridgeport when he was at WICC. So, but, you know, and then his second wife, she was um, Sigurd Valdis, who was on Hogan's Heroes, played Clink's second secretary. Um, she got into the marriage with a whole bunch of information. She knew what she was getting into. And she let him have that freedom, uh, just come home to me. And so, you know, that's that's between him and wife number one and wife number two. Yeah. What I can tell you is that Anne was still very much a part of the family even though they divorced, she went and married again. Uh, and they were, you know, when she found out that Bob was murdered, she was devastated. So, you know, it, there, there were the sanctity of their marriages, both Anne's and Patty's. Uh, Patty Olson was Sigurd's uh, real name, not stage name. That was between them. And who are we to judge what they had in their marriages while Bob was playing on the side. But what we can know is that in the end, he decided he did not want to continue that. Right. Now, was, it's, yeah, go ahead. And I was in it, it was actively looking for help. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, we, we interviewed four clinical psychologists because we're not, we don't, you know, that's not who we are. We, we can't put Bob Crane on a couch and try and psychoanalyze him and neither can they. But based on the information that we had at the very end of, uh, I shouldn't say at the very end, but because the research even continues to this day. But we, towards the end of our research phase, when we were writing the book, I was writing the book, Linda was editing the book. Um, we reached out to several clinical, four uh, got back to us and we interviewed them. And we said, here's what we know. Tell us, you know, in your professional opinion, what this means. And we had different um, you know, opinions coming from these four clinical psychologists based on our information, plus Reverend Beck's information that he gave to us. Um, I also, I, I, I will tell you, I work on uh, one of the nursing publications that I work on is Urologic Nursing Journal, which can be an interesting journal at times. But what that gave me uh, was an expert in men's se sexual health. And her name is Suzanne Qualick. She's a she's a, a doctor of nursing. Uh, she has her PhD, and what she she gave us a couple of uh, insights into just sexual addiction. And one of the things that she told us in relation to Bob Crane 
And the book, and this is a quote that she gave us, is this book sheds light on an addiction that is tragically confined to the shadows behind closed doors. Sex addicts are subject to immediate moral judgment when we are ironically more accepting of other addictions. Bob Crane, the definitive biography, can serve as an inspiration to anyone seeking to understand the often double world of the sex addict. And that was from Suzanne Qualick, who's the editor now of Urologic Nursing Journal. So that, I think, sums it up very succinctly about the moral judgment and the double world. Just because Bob was having sex with women doesn't mean he was doing what Bill Cosby was doing. He was having consensual sex. And we yeah, it's like, oh, you know, you know, you get all like, but it, at the end of the day, it's, it's not that big a deal until it became an addiction. And that's when he sought to change it. Now, it's also really interesting, really quickly, that Bob wasn't just filming his sexual escapades. Bob Crane was, he was, chronicling everything in his life and that's another piece that people get wrong they think that it's all just the sex and it's mountains and mountains of sex that he's that he's videoing he's recording everything he's recording trips to the dentist and he's recording dinner conversations and he's recording you know when he goes out and sits in for jazz band he's he's recording just about everything and he's chronicling he was almost a, he was obsessively it was an obsessive compulsive thing that he was doing he wanted to record he had journals and he had audio tapes and he had film and it was all meshed in together it was just another part of his life and when you look at his whole life this is actually just a very small piece of it that just gets blown up out of proportion a lot you know because they don't understand that he's doing he's recording everything that's going on in his life Right. They're just honing in on the the more mm -hmm. um, scandalous parts yeah. of it. No, yeah. Nothing too scandalous about a trip to the dentist. No, no, not at all. Or birthday I, guess, I guess it all depends, Christmas. though. I guess yeah. it all depends. <laughs> yeah. It depends on if you start freaking out because, no, don't give me that cavity. <laughs> um, well, uh, Carol, where can people buy uh, Bob Crane, the definitive biography? Sure. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can get it through our publisher, AM Inc. Publishing. You can go through our website for links to all of the places that, uh, the, you know, the big places that it's at, um, which is voteforbobcrane.org. That's vote, the number four, bobcrane.org. And uh, all of our interviews are up there. All of, we have a YouTube channel. We have Facebook, Twitter, all, you know, every, every social media, Instagram, uh, you know, pretty much all of them few not. Uh, but we have a pretty large uh, Facebook or social media presence, YouTube. You can go to YouTube and actually listen to some of his radio shows and hear how he was. He's much different sounding on the radio than he was on Hogan's Heroes. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear um, the, the two different voices that you, the one that you're used to hearing on Hogan's Heroes and then the one that, you know, his radio persona that he's, he's on behind the mic. So voteforbobcrane.org is where you can find everything. And if people want to follow you on social media, uh, do you have any social media handles or a website that you want to share with us? Sure. Uh, I, again, I can. Uh, my website is carolmford.com. And that's Carol M as in Mary Ford.com. And all my social media stuff, I have Facebook and all of the all of the fun things there as well. So you can find me there. Well, I'll be sure to put all of that in the show notes so people don't have to write it down as they're trying to drive. <laughs> perhaps on the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut. Oh, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carol, thanks for stopping by Uncorking Story and letting me uncork yours and Bob's. Yes, thank you so much. It was, it was really great to be here. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.